what I feel has to change between the police and the community is 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 the right narrative being told. Everything has a narrative. Everything that goes on has a narrative. And in every narrative, there's a, a hero and a villain. The problem is we make heroes villains and villains heroes instead of realizing that nobody's the hero in these stories. You know what I mean? I got family who are police officers. I got family who've been uh, abused by the police. So it's not making out one side of the situation to be the ultimate hero and the other side to be the ultimate villain. It's realizing that, man, we live in a broken society. Um, it's frail, it's full of biases, and we need the people who are in control and in charge to realize that as well. So when you put police officers in charge, you got to do that with the, with the knowledge that they have biases and that they're imperfect people and that they're wielding all this power. When you see people outraged and angered from police brutality or injustice, it's, it's being able to, to put your arm around them and help them process their anger in a healthy way. Because you're either going to process something wrong done to you in a deconstructive way or a constructive way. If we're not helping people process it in a constructive way, it's always going to be destruction. You know, what are you going to expect if you see the abuse of power, you know, on people and they don't know how to eat? process that or they have no due diligence to, to deal with that. So I just think at the end of the day, it's not making out one person to be the hero and one to be the villain. I got I got friends who are career criminals. You know what I'm saying? So it's not as if everybody's perfect on all sides, but it's just being available to 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 see the narrative clearly and uh, to help people navigate through that. I see a great disparity. It's disproportionate uh, numbers as of, you know, people of color who are poor, being mistreated, killed, arrested, versus, you know, people coming from suburban, middle, upper class. And I mean, there's a lot of reasons for that. You know, obviously, um, when you have people in power exercising bias and exercising stereotypes and prejudice, you just you just see another person who looks poor and you're like, I know why you did what you did. You know, you did it for this reason. This is where you are. And because you've labeled them, you, you feel like you're making a, I don't know what, what you feel like, but you're making decisions based off of labels and stereotypes and biases. When you label people, you, you, you strip away the beauty of their complexity. You know what I mean? Everybody who lives in the hood is not a drug dealer, is not a killer, is not a gang member. There's, there's, there's geniuses on the blocks in the hood who are hanging out on the same corner with the killers and the gangsters. They go to school every day, they make good grades, they're geniuses, and when you just kind of typecast them because you know you look just like him you come from this particular area now you've exercised your bias and and you've jeopardized somebody's future and somebody's you know lives and we've seen it happen over and over again we've all got friends and and family members who you know have become a product of this you know and uh and then there's a cycle man it's a cycle that has to be broken it's a cycle that goes back to you know, uh, the war on drugs in the 80s and the 90s where you've got this overwhelming amount of drugs flowing in, into the community because of stuff happening in Nicaragua and, and, and aid given to Central and South America. And then you've also got this war where they're locking up an unproportionate amount. In 1995, I think it was like a quarter of non-college educated black men were in prison. You know what I mean? And so you're looking at this reality happening for people who are not college educated, who are not wealthy and well off, they're warehoused um, because of their lack of wealth, understanding, education, their stereotype, their typecast. And, um, and it's unfortunate, man. And one of the problems we have is we just look at our nation as if we forget that 50 years ago, like the civil rights era was popping off. You know what I mean? Like my mother had to drink out of colored water fountains. Like we act like that. That didn't just happen. That just happened. We have to get rid of this idealistic picture that all that's over. We're, we're good now. We're in a healthy place. If we can just recognize, no, we still got a long way to go. We got a lot of stuff to, to wrestle with. Then we'll be in a better situation. We can move forward. Where's today's average, you know, 25 to 40 year old? Where are they in, in the mix? Are they thinking that they're individualized to the point where they're trying to impress a younger demographic? Or are they trying to actually aspire to being an old, you know, an old head? Don't be a coward and say, no, I'm not. I'm different from everybody else. No, you're a role model. You are. And I'm in this game because I feel like we need to demand more accountability from our artists. Good art should comfort the disturbed and disturb the comfortable. When I thought about um, like what I want to do in music is I want to create meaningful conversations you know, inside of hip hop because I feel like, again, we live in a very like trivial kind of culture. We're still making the same music, the same movies, at what point do we wake up 
and I'm not sitting here being judgmental because I'm still trying to wake up. 